Hi, this is Melanie Likowski here to share with you about grading with proficiency scales and some of the differences you're going to find between this new way of grading and uh, traditional ways of grading. First, the research and why. Um, many school districts have switched to using uh, scales for grading or sometimes they call it standards-based grading and this was based on research that Marzano and Hasta did in 2009 showing that among the variety of teaching strategies that help students um, advance in concept knowledge and understanding tracking student progress and scoring scales was the most effective What are scales exactly? Scales are just a way to um, focus your learning goal and break it down into easier steps for students. Um, everybody knows what learning goals and learning objectives are. Teachers have had those forever, um, but usually students never see them. Your learning goals and your objectives help you plan. They help you choose your curriculum. They help you choose the assessments for your unit or your weeks or your quarter. Um, but students never have access to this. So when you create a scale, you are showing students um, what they're learning. And you are helping them along, which means connecting some of their prior knowledge from previous grade levels and things they've already been exposed to making that connection to the expectation for the current year, and then maybe even above. So here's how a scale looks. It provides a path of learning. Number one is going to be for students who are very on the low end. They may have special needs. They may be English language learners, which is a different struggle from learning content, but it's still going to set them back a little bit and you'll have to make modifications for them. Um, any of your students who require special learning modifications or have special learning plans, any of your students who are far below grade level who are going to need a lot of hand holding and a lot of concrete support to understand concepts, those are your level ones. Level twos will be most of the students in your class. They have some knowledge from the previous grade level. If you look at this fourth grade scale, the level two is from a third grade standard so that you know what they come in being exposed to. Not all your students will have mastered the content from previous grade levels, but you know for sure they've seen it before and it's a great starting place to assess their previous knowledge and give you something to talk about and something to refer to. Level three is the grade level standard. So if you take a look at the text for adults, multiply or divide, to solve word problems involving multiplicative comparison, that's obviously the standard for you. That's not something students are going to understand. So we change that into language they can understand better, and we put it in a simple sentence. Number three is always going to be the learning goal for your students at grade level. So you can see a simple pro progression here of skills and conceptual understanding. They're going to help your students go from one to three. All your students come in at different places, so it's kind of helpful to have a different levels that they can refer to. Level four is not required for all students to master. Um, it depends what your district expects. Usually your gifted and high ability students might be working at level four or will be required to advance to level four. This is a higher application of grade level skills, higher order thinking skills, different ways to use the grade level content. You could go in greater depth or in greater breadth, but basically level four is advanced use of related content of the same learning goal. So here's your learning goal at the top and here is the path that your students are going to take one two three four once you start using scales in your classroom you'll notice they significantly change your grading mindset traditional grading is based on quantity which is you give a test with a bunch of different go learning goals a bunch of different skills this is an example of a language arts test for second graders. You're going to have questions about vocabulary, comprehension, maybe the story structure, um, answering questions, 
A lot of different skills are usually mixed into these traditional tests and students get a grade based on the quantity they get right, so their percentage. When you start working with a scale, you're gonna notice they're about the quality of understanding. So you're focusing on one learning goal at a time. Here's another second grade example. I can ask and answer important questions to show I understand what I'm reading. Here are some of the important questions. Who, what, why, where, when, how? The scale shows that a student at level three would be totally proficient at doing this themselves and they'd be able to ask questions that are pertinent to understanding the story. Level two, I can ask and answer some questions by myself. They might need to reread. Some of their questions might not be totally relevant. Things like that. They're going to have a lower quality of proficiency with this scale. Level one, they're your kids that need a lot of extra support. And level four, these are your kids who could probably teach the class how to do this, who would have an in-depth understanding, and maybe even be able to analyze like what questions are the best questions. Um, to understand the story or to answer certain questions that are asked to them. So each level of your scale shows a different quality of understanding. And this gets translated for a lot of teachers into percentages and the scale can get confusing at that point. So let's look at a couple of examples of how to do that because usually even if you're assessing students based on the quality of their understanding, you still have to turn that into percentage for your report cards. So let's see how that's done. The first thing to consider is the meaning of each level of your scale. So in the art and science of teaching, I was introduced to this in 2010 through my school district. We were required to start using these and creating these. Uh, we all struggled a little bit to figure out how that, what that would look like and how we would put this together, but over time I kind of figured out a simple pattern. Level three again, score three, is your grade level expectation. So whatever content standard you have, level three would be no major errors or omissions regarding the information and processes. That means they have the knowledge and they can use it in whatever way they're required to at that grade level. So score three is the grade level expectation. Score two is having some minor errors, maybe missing some details, maybe forgetting a few things, maybe needing a little support, but they're mostly getting it. That's where most of your students are gonna probably come in. Level one, these are your kids that need a lot more support. A score of zero would be someone with some serious learning disabilities or maybe some serious behavioral challenges. Your score four is about in-depth and applications. So students take the grade level information and they do more with it. Again, sometimes that's required by school districts and sometimes it's not. Once you understand the meaning for each level of the scale, it's a little easier to think about relating that to a traditional grading scale. Let's look at one. How do we make this transition from percentages to scales? Um, in Marzano's book, Formative Assessment and Standards-Based Grading, he offers several different approaches for how to grade, how to create assessments, how to assess assessments over time, um, whether you're blending many standards together for one subject, like all your math standards for the quarter, or whether you're just looking at growth over time for each objective. This is what I found simplest. Teachers first translate scores on the scale to percentage scores, then average the percentages. That's pretty much what we're used to doing already, so it's easiest to understand. If you look at the grading scale I have at the right, this is what my district used, and it's suggestive, so you'll notice a couple of the scales overlap, and that's because every district, every school, has some flexibility to decide how they want to approach this with the understanding that you know what each level means. Level three is always grade level. Two is most of your students working toward grade level mastery. One is your kids far below. Four is your kids who are advanced. 
Now, when it comes to things like work quality, turning assignments in on time, I worked with gifted and high achieving students for a long time. I also worked with reading intervention students, the whole spectrum, and kind of got to see a lot of the patterns and tendencies. And um, my gifted kids were not always the ones getting 100%. So if you look at this scale and you think of it as an endpoint, well, 4.0, you have to have 100%. You're going to have very few students reaching that 4.0 level. And really what the 4.0 means is a range, not an endpoint. It's a range of students who have mastered grade level content and are ready to work above. And that could be anywhere from probably 90, 95 to 100%. So here in the image, 4.0 would be a range between about 95% and 100 because you definitely want to catch your highest level students who have securely mastered grade level content before giving them extra challenges. So usually they're performing really well. Your three and a half, those are students who have passed grade level skills. So they're in that three, level three range, but they're on the higher end. So they've more securely passed it. And Marzano suggests using half scales as well, just to have more flexibility in your grading. So you can see how the 3.0, 3.5, and 4.0 could potentially be broken up into those five and five percentiles, all of those being A's. Right, because if you a student actually passes grade level skills, getting an A is fair. Getting a B could also be fair. Maybe they're on the lower end. Maybe they kind of just barely pass the grade level skills. They're not a 3.5. They're more like a 3.0. That could definitely be a B student. Now, anyone who's still in the level 2 range, they're still working toward grade level mastery. They're not there yet. So if you think about traditional interpretations of a C, or the C percentiles between 70 and 80 percent. Yeah, that's what that means. You're not quite there yet, but you're close. So maybe you're good enough. Maybe it's one subject that's not your strength. You're doing fine and everything else. But C means you're not quite there yet. So maybe two and a half, maybe two. D and E, those are on the lower end of the scale. That's your low twos and your ones, your students who are really struggling. You're going to notice 50th percentile is the very bottom of the scale. There's a reason for this. We're going to take a look at that on the next slide. Deciding on your scale. So things to consider. I already mentioned kind of the traditional meanings of A, B, C, and D. The traditional understandings of the percentiles that go along with A, B, C, and D. And understanding the meaning of each level of the scale. So if three means you pass grade level, you should definitely be getting an A or a B on the higher or lower end of passing grade level content. 4.0, even 3.5 could be your higher students. Maybe they're working above, maybe they're not quite above, but they've shown a high level of mastery for grade level. Levels 2 and 1, those are your struggling kids. Maybe they're close if they're 2, 2.5. Maybe they're not if they're a 1. They still have a long ways to get to grade level. Special groups, again, you want to consider, is it only going to be your gifted kids who are in the 4.0 range, or is that not really fair if you also have high-level students who are mastering grade-level content? How flexible will you be in those percentages? I like to look at it as a range of grades and not just an endpoint so that you give all of your students a chance to advance if they're really proving mastery. Last point, never go below 50%, and here is why. Because statistically, when you average out your numbers, having zeros for missing work really brings the student's grade down to the point where they probably can't recover that quarter. If you look at the first example, 90%, 85, 78, 88, 92, and zero. Those first five grades are pretty good. That's a student who's definitely mastering content if they're mostly in the 80s and 90s. Even a 78 is like pretty much there. Maybe they made a couple extra mistakes. Their average of a 72 does not reflect their overall performance. So that zero just really throws things off. In the second example, if you give that student a 50% instead for missing work, understanding that's still an E, still a failing grade, it's still missing something huge, that pulls their grade down to an 80%, which would be like a B minus on most scales. That's a little more reasonable considering the effort 
and mastery they've shown on all of their other assignments and it's a little closer to showing a true and fair average for them. So I hope this has given you some helpful things to consider as you solidify your grading scale, understand the meanings of each level, and start applying it to your own assessments. If you'd like any more help or examples, please visit my website, mrsalslevellearning.com. I have proficiency scales, portfolios, and assessments already made for grades 1 through 8 in math and language arts. Um, new things coming out all the time, and I definitely love to get feedback and hear how it's working for people in your classroom. Um, feel free to leave any comments or feedback, and thank you for your time.